Hello everyone and good evening to you. The White Army is blessed to have Dr. Raj Shekhar here as our mentor today. Welcome to you, sir. Thank you. I'd also like to welcome all the active members to this session. And with the with the permission of our mentor, let's please begin the session. Yeah, I'm starting. I think right ahead. So good evening, uh, everybody. So today, it's a long gap. I think after two weeks. So it's all busy. Uh, so I have decided to take this topic that is hypocalcemia on request to complete all the dyselectrolytemias before going into the hardcore medicine discussions. So, <clears throat> so in the last uh, previous classes, we have dealt with the acid base imbalances and the uh, dysnatremias. And uh, today's and the next class will be based on the calcium disturbances. So today, we will be dealing with hypocalcemia, how to approach diagnosis, and what uh, actually comes when practicing hypocalcemia in day to day life and emergency medicine. So, this is indeed a very important topic <coughs> for all the medicines, nephrology, and endocrinology sections. We know that calcium ion has been a very critical uh, cation in the normal cellular function in day to day life, which involves the neuromuscular signaling, the cardiac contractility, the hormone secretion and blood coagulation, which we have learned in our physiology and biochemistry classes in the first year. So this extracellular calcium uh, is being maintained in a very narrow range with the feedback mechanisms under the control of mainly two hormones, that is the parathyroid hormone and the active vitamin D metabolite. So the any abnormalities in the parathyroid hormone or vitamin D directly or indirectly is going to alter your calcium concentration. So indeed, which is going to alter your all the basic physiological functions causing the abnormalities in the patient. So uh, in recently, there has been a new hormone uh, in the uh, discovery that is called as FGF 23, that is fibroblast derived growth factor 23, has been also considered as the main hormone in the calcium management uh, but more of a phosphate uh, management is done by FGF23, but indirectly it is going to alter your calcium uh, by altering the phosphate concentrations. So now we can say that parathyroid hormone vitamin D along with FGF23 is going to alter your calcium abnormalities. <clears throat> this uh, disorders of this uh, serum calcium concentrations are relatively common uh, in day-to-day -day practice and even in the emergencies. So 90% of the patients which are going to admit in case of ICU are invariably having the hypocalcemia. <clears throat> so we need to know what is this and how does this act and what the treatment should be done in these kind of patients. So before going into the abnormalities, we need to know the homeostasis of this calcium in the body. So this calcium in our body is maintained within a very nor narrow normal range. So this narrow normal range is maintained as we discussed through the actions of the various hormones that is parathyroid hormone and the vitamin D. So whenever the calcium is in the blood, it is transported partly by binding to the proteins. So if you see the total amount of the calcium in the body, the 50, 40 to 50 percent is being bound to the proteins. Among the protein, albumin is the major protein. And only some amount like 10 to 15 percent is being transported with the binding to the other anions like the citrate, the phosphate, the sulfates, etc. But the remaining 50 percent is being free. This is also called as ionized state calcium. And this is the metabolically active or physiologically active part of the calcium. Whereas the bound calcium to be active, need to dissociate from the bind state to get free, then only it can able to act. So the storage form is we can call it as a protein bound form, whereas the ionized state is called as metabolically active form. So if you see this narrow normal range, the normal serum calcium concentration is considered as the 8.5 to 10.5 milligram per deciliter, whereas if you use the international standard units that is 2.12 to 2.62 millimoles per liter it depends on the lab but various indian laboratories give the serum calcium levels in milligram per deciliter so it is better to remember the milligram per deciliter whereas if you go for a us or uk the laboratory does mention the si units 
in millimoles per liter even your in your us mle based questions or mrcb based questions the values are going to come in standard units that is millimoles per liter and we need to know what is the normal ionized calcium levels also it is 4.6 to 5.25 mg per deciliter or 1.16 to 1.31 millimoles per liter so we we should know both the normal ionized state calcium and the normal serum calcium so any serum calcium that is below 8.5 according to harrison it is 8.3 but it is easy to remember as 8.5 so less than 8.5 is considered as the hypocalcemia and more than 10.5 is considered as hypercalcemia so for all the practical purposes from now on any thing which is less than 8.5 we will be taking it as the hypocalcemia so in this calcium homeostasis to get altered the three imbalances should be there either the albumin level is been not normal or the acid base disturbances or the any hormonal imbalances the main hormonal imbalances are any imbalance in the parathyroid or the vitamin d is going to alter your calcium homeostasis uh, let us discuss one by one the alterations in the albumin level and the acid base disturbances are mainly seen in the setting of an acute care or acute care disturbances Uh, whereas the hormonal imbalances are usually cause of a chronic hypocalcemia, so we know that the fifty uh, to sixty percent of this calcium is bound to the serum proteins that is mainly albumin. So any amount of decrease in the albumin is going to alter your serum sodium serum calcium. So reduced serum total calcium uh, is seen with a normal ionized calcium in this case of hypoalbuminemia. so in hypoalbuminemia if you measure the ionized calcium it will be normal as ionized calcium is not been affected by the serum albumin levels whereas the total calcium may come low because of reduced albumin level this that's why the terminology has been used as the pseudo hypocalcemia so the equation here is the serum total concentration falls approximately by 0.8 mg per deciliter for every 1 g reduction in the serum albumin concentration so Uh, many of the uh, doctors use this particular formula that is calcium that is corrected calcium in case of hypoalbuminemia is equal to the measured serum calcium plus 0.8 times the difference between the uh, albumin uh, in your patient so this particular formula is been in use since the many years like i think more than 50 to 60 years <clears throat> but there have been a lot of uh, controversies regarding the uh, use of this corrected calcium because after the uh, original article from dr pain comes uh, into the existence this particular formula has been in use so that's why the formula is also been called as pain formula so this formula has become so rampant that each and every day every physician is using corrected calcium so even with a normal serum calcium people tend to use this formula so which might overestimate your calcium levels in your body so whenever you have a doubt you have to measure the ionized calcium to actually rule out whether the patient is having hypocalcemia or not so to use a corrected calcium level in each patient is not going to uh, justify the measurement of calcium actually in the body there are a lot of controversies regarding this because uh, the why you think the calcium uh, needs to be corrected for hypoalbuminemia yes we knew that the calcium was uh, less available uh, with albumin for the binding so hypoalbuminemia should theoretically decrease the amount of calcium but this relation is not proportional like every uh, drop in albumin is going to increase the affinity of the calcium with the albumin so this correction equations become very less accurate as the hypoalbuminemia worsens so in all these patients like especially in a case of the chronic liver disease where hypoalbuminemia is very common along with the hypocalcemia because of the malabsorption or reduced intake so this patient needs to underestimate the importance of the hypocalcemia in these patients so it is not universal to use this corrected calcium in all the patients but you need to know what is corrected calcium what is the relation between the calcium and the albumin for all the theoretical purpose and for the exam purpose but for practical purposes it is not prudent to use this formula in each and every day practice whenever you have a doubt you should measure directly the ionized calcium levels in the body please remember this uh, many of the laboratories uh, have been uh, 
equipped with ionized calcium measurements, although it is not been available in rural places or small setting of hospitals, but all the uh, big hospitals have the uh, facility to measure the ionized calcium directly nowadays. So nowadays we... Uh, we generally uh, should not use this corrected calcium in all the patients in the community. There's a lot of disturbance. One of the participants has a uh, iPhone need to mute their um, audio. Post Ms. Nandini. Okay. So <clears throat> it is always prudent to measure the ionized calcium directly whenever you have a doubt. <clears throat> so acid base imbalances are going to alter the affinity between the albumin and the calcium. So we can see this. In this equation, albumin is a negatively charged compound which attracts the positive compounds. So whenever there is a case of alkalosis where the positive H plus ions have been reduced, so the affinity for calcium is going to uh, increase so that the more and more calcium gets bound to albumin, reducing the amount of ionized calcium. So which can cause the sudden hypocalcemia in case of alkalosis patients. So this has been very common in emergency practice where you see a young girl who due to hysterical hyperventilation comes to you with a sudden onset tetany or the carpopedal spasms. So even when you measure calcium, it is total calcium might come normal. But if you measure the ionized calcium in during that, part, that particular time, they may have a low ionized calcium. So alkalosis causes the reduction in the ionized calcium concentration, whereas the acidosis has got a reversive, reversing effect. If we increase the ionized calcium concentration because the affinity for the calcium is going to decrease <clears throat> in presence of more H plus ions. This is very, very important, the respiratory alkalosis, uh, the relation between the alkalosis and how the alkalosis causes tetany is very, very important in day-to-day -day practice. This has been the famous questions of the examiners also. So the next and the most important uh, way the calcium gets regulated in our body is the hormones. That is the parathyroid hormone and vitamin D. They have got a very strict control of the potassium in the uh, calcium in the body. Through their action uh, in three major organs, that is bone, kidney, and GIT. For example, if there is low calcium in the body, your parathyroid is going to be secreted very rapidly in response to even a small degree of uh, drop in the serum calcium, which is going to act on the bone to increase the output of calcium from the bone to the serum, and which is going to decrease your urinary uh, calcium secretion in the kidney, increasing the more and more reabsorption, and the GIT through its action on vitamin D by increasing its absorption. So this has been a very uh, famous algorithm we have learned in physiology and biochemistry. The, any significant drop or even a smaller change in ECF calcium concentration is a major and a potent stimulus for the parathyroid glands to secrete the parathyroid. So this parathyroid glands acts mainly on two organs, that is one is bone, another one is kidney. From the bone, there is increased osteoplastic activity causing the bone resorption and thereby increasing the ECF concern, calcium concentration and through its action on kidney, by increasing the reabsorption of the calcium is going to increase the calcium. Whereas the effect of parathyroid gland on the GIT is indirect. It is through the vitamin D, which is going to increase the calcium reabsorption from the gut. So this is also an uh, entrance question. The parathyroid glands act directly on bone, kidney, and intestine and all. So it is not all. It is only bone and kidney, which has got a direct effect of parathyroid glands, whereas the effect on the intestine is through the vitamin D. It is not from the direct parathyroid hormone. This is a very important thing to remember here. 
So before going into the causes of this hypercalcemia, we need to know one very important receptor function here, that is what is CASR, that is calcium sensing receptor. So these receptors are situated mainly in the parathyroid glands and kidney. These senses the ambient calcium concentration in day-to-day -day life. So <clears throat> these are very highly expressed in case of the uh, uh, chief cells of the uh, parathyroid gland. This senses the any small variation in the calcium concentration. So any fall in serum concentration of a calcium is a very potent stimulus to increase the PTH through the action of the calcium sensing receptor. Whereas its function is equally important in case of the kidney, here it is a very important regulator of the calcium excretion. They are mainly situated in the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle, in the basolateral membrane, and their main function is to inhibit the calcium reabsorption. So there are two particular diseases, the mainly genetic diseases which are associated with the abnormalities of this function, which are very important for the entrance purpose. If there are inactivating mutations, that means if the calcium sensing receptor is not acting properly through any genetic mutation, this causes familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. We know the CASR is going to inhibit the calcium reabsorption. If there is inactivation of this channel, there is no inhibition. That's why there is a familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. Whereas if there are activating mutations, in this case of activating mutation, the uh, channel is being constituently active in the parathyroid glands, increasing the threshold for the ETH hormone. So even in case of hypocalcemia, your parathyroid gland is not going to act. And similarly, in case of kidney, there is no uh, calcium reabsorption due to increased uh, activity of this hormone causing autosomal dominant hypocalcemia. So the CASR function is very, very important. Uh, the questions do appear based on this channel. Uh, what are the inactivating mutations uh, causes? What is the activating mutation is associated with? So inactivating mutation is associated with familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. This particular disease we'll be discussing when we deal with hypercalcemia. Whereas the activating mutation of this channel causes the autosomal dominant hypocalcemia. We will be discussing this uh, particular syndrome today. So therefore, as we see, whenever we see a hypocalcemia, we know that the parathyroid gland is very active. It is going to sense the drop in the calcium, which is going to correct the, any hypocalcemia which exists in your body. So if hypocalcemia to occur, the parathyroid hormone has to be working inefficiently even in to normalize the serum calcium. So one set of hypocalcemia is occur with the low PTH concentration in your body that is called as hypoparathyroidism. So any amount of decrease in the function of parathyroid gland is going to cause hypocalcemia directly. No much explanation required regarding this. Whereas there are other diseases where parathyroid gland is acting normally, but the hypocalcemia is caused by some other reason other than the parathyroid gland function. So here parathyroid is going to act uh, much more aggressive way in compared to the normal way. So that's why it is called a secondary hyperparathyroidism where it is also associated with hypocalcemia with high PTH. So there are diseases of hypocalcemia with low PTH and there are hypocalcemia uh, associated with high PTH. So hypocalcemia with low PTH is being considered as hypoparathyroidism. Whereas any patient of hypocalcemia with high PTH is considered as secondary hyperparathyroidism, where the defect is not in the parathyroid gland, the parathyroid is gland is working properly, whereas the disease is there in the some other uh, <coughs> reason of the body. So we know that the uh, first category of hypocalcemia is with the hypocalcemia with low PTH in our patients. So the hypoparathyroidism where the hypocalcemia is there with low PTH can occur in the three abnormality section. Either there is a destruction of the parathyroid gland or the abnormal parathyroid gland development or the regulation of PTH, either secretion or storage has been abnormal in the parathyroid glands. So first, if you see the destruction of parathyroid glands, the most common cause of this is the surgical cause. So any amount of surgery in the neck 
especially the significant surgeries like the th thyroid surgeries, the parathyroid surgeries, the radical neck dissection, which is done for head and neck cancers, any vascular surgeries. So they are usually associated with this hypoparathyroidism. In, in fact, if somebody asks you what is the most common cause of the hypoparathyroidism, then it is the surgical intervention on the neck. So this surgical hypoparathyroidism being the most common can be transient or can be permanent. Transient is usually due to disruption of the vascular supply. <coughs> For example, if the patient has undergone some thyroid surgeries, so due to manipulation of the vessels during the surgery, there has been a transient reduction in the blood supply. It may be persist for like one day, two day, or sometimes one week. Whereas after some time, it is going to recover once the vascular uh, circulation is being established in these patients. Whereas in minority of the patients, it is permanent. For example, if the whole four of the thyroid parathyroid glands have been reduced, uh, have been removed inadvertently or due to some other reason like parathyroid hyperplasia secondary to multiple endocrine neoplasia. So sometimes the hypoparathyroidism can be permanent and even it can occur when there is an inferior thyroid artery injury during the surgery, uh, which can cause the permanent uh, hypoparathyroidism. It can be intermittent sometimes, like after the surgery, the thyroid reserve has been reduced, like the normal day-to-day -day function, it can work properly. Whenever there is an increased need of this parathyroid fun function, it is not going to compensate for the increased need. So this can manifest as intermittent hypocalcemia. <coughs> Another entity is called as hungry bone syndrome, which has been most commonly observed after the parathyroidectomy in a patient of primary or tertiary hyperparathyroidism. We'll discuss in the next uh, coming slides about the hungry bone syndrome. So if a patient has a hypoparathyroidism and there is no history of surgery, then the most common cause comes as autoimmune. So this is the most common cause of an acquired hypoparathyroidism. So this sometimes can be permanent. So here the autoimmune destruction is directly, the antibodies are directed towards the chief cells of the parathyroid gland. Whereas sometimes the antibodies are directed against the calcium sensing receptors that decreases the PTS secretion. So this can also occur. So the two types of autoantibodies uh, are observed in case of autoimmune hypoparathyroidism. Either the antibodies are directed directly against the parathyroid gland or they can be directly uh, directed against the calcium sensing receptor. So this autoimmune hypoparathyroidism can exist as an isolated syndrome involving only parathyroid glands or it can be a part of the polyendocrine syndrome, the most common <coughs> of which is being APS1, that is the autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type 1, which has been also associated with the, the typical chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis and the Addison's disease in young patients. So whenever you see a patient of the uh, candidiasis and hypocalcemia, you need to rule out the autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type 1, which is not so uncommon as you see in book, which is common. I think I have seen two to three patients of this APS1 syndrome in my practice. So we, you need to uh, suspect the cause of hypocalcemia with the candidiasis, with any uh, no history of any surgery uh, being done on the neck. You need to suspect this autoimmune destruction of the parathyroid glands. Whereas the, there are other rare causes of this hypoparathyroidism, that is the radiation injury to the neck for some other purpose or the infiltrating diseases. Like if you see in case of the hemochromatosis or some lymphomas okay, or some uh, <coughs> tuberculosis or any granulomatous diseases can have any storage disorders can infiltrate parathyroid glands and reduce the secretion of PTH, although very rarely seen. Uh, end stage uh, HIV disease, that is AIDS, where there is a direct infiltration of this HIV virus into the parathyroid glands can also cause hypoparathyroidism. Hypocalcemia has been very common in case of HIV, especially with the patients of very low CD4 count and very high uh, RNA load in their pa patients. <clears throat> so I told you the uh, about the hungry bone syndrome, where the bone is hungry for the calcium. Why does it occur? This is occur uh, I can give you an example in case of hyperparathyroidism. Supposedly, if the patient has primary hyperparathyroidism, so since to, due to increased parathyroid action, there is increased osteoclastic activity in the bones. 
causing bone resorption and all the calcium from the bone is going to come into the serum causing hypercalcemia. So in these patients, we usually advise them to undergo parathyroidectomy. So if you do a parathyroidectomy in the patient of hyperparathyroidism suddenly, in the immediate post-operative period, there is a sudden drop in the PTH concentration in the body. <clears throat> so this sudden drop in the PTH concentration shifts the metabolism from the high bone turnover state to the low bone turnover state. So now the osteoblastic activity is going to increase because of low PTH. <clears throat> so this increased osteoblastic activity is going to consume all the calcium which is there in the ECF. This can cause sudden hypocalcemia as if the bones were hungry of calcium. So this is what is called as hungry bone syndrome. So this was typically uh, described in case of parathyroidectomy for hyperparathyroidism. Although it, it is not, it does not occur in all patients, it does occur in some patients. We need to be careful about this particular syndrome, uh, especially if the patient has undergone the hyperparathyroidism, uh, parathyroidectomy, especially the three and a half parathyroidectomy. Uh, these patients uh, do develop hungry bone syndrome in the next less than 48 hours. So this can also be seen in other disorders, like if the untreated severe hyperthyroidism, like if the patient has graves or if patient has any toxic nodule, the hyperthyroidism we know is a catabolic state or a high bone turnover state. So if you do a thyroidectomy in this patient, suddenly the high turnover state is going to become a low bone turnover state. So again, the calcium is going to be taken up by the osteoblastic activity. Same in case of rickets or osteomalacia. We know that there is a vitamin D deficiency in these patients. So if you give the vitamin D to these patients without giving any calcium, so whatever the calcium which is there in the ECF is going to be taken up by the increased osteoblastic activity when you supplement the vitamin D. So again, this is seen in hungry bone syndrome. So any patient of vitamin D deficiency, even the children or adults, you cannot provide the vitamin D without giving them the calcium supplementations. This is a must. Again, the institution of the anti-resorptive therapy in patients with osteoblastic metastasis. We know that usual metastasis are osteoclastic, uh, whereas there are some metastasis which are osteoblastic like the, bone, uh, the breast metastasis, the CA breast metastasis or CA prostate. They sometimes can be osteoblastic, where the osteoblastic activity is more. So if you give an anti-resorptive therapy, for example, if you give these patients some anti-resorptive therapy, these patients are going to have... Uh, increased calcium. And again, the Cushing syndrome we know is the high bone turnover state. So if you uh, undergo the curative surgery for this Cushing syndrome, the hungry bone syndrome can be seen. <clears throat> so the main reason for our patients to develop the hungry bone syndrome is sudden change from the high bone turnover state to the low bone turnover state. This has to be sudden. So uh, for example, in case of the parathyroidectomy, uh, immediately after removing the parathyroid gland, we take a sample of the PTH and we send for the lab while well, the patient is on table only. So immediately after taking the uh, parathyroid glands, the parathyroid hormone level should drop by 50% to prove that uh, the treatment has been done perfectly. So if this drop is more than 65%, then the risk of hypocalcemia or risk of hungry bone syndrome post-surgery is being very common. So, so we need to know the, we need to uh, check the sample immediately after the parathyroid glands are removed and send it for a PTH estimation. If the risk is more than 65%, yes, in the post-operative period, you will be very careful in the patient calcium management. So you'll be monitoring the calcium much more frequently in these patients. So next uh, uh, causes of this uh, low PTH with hypocalcemia are the abnormal uh, parathyroid gland development. There are many disorders associated with this uh, abnormal development of the gland. This can be X-linked disorders, these are autosomal recessive disorders, and these disorders can be isolated to parathyroid glands, or they can be associated with the other abnormalities also. Well, the uh, typical of this is the B. George syndrome, or also called the velocardiofacial syndrome, where there is the abnormal development of the thymus gland along with the parathyroid gland. So these patients are usually not able to survive beyond the age of six to 10, eight years because of the abnormal thymus gland. They are much more prone for some serious infections. And since the parathyroid gland is not normal, the hypocalcemia is going to be very severe. And along with this, the patients are coexist to have the cardiac abnormalities in these patients. There are other syndromes associated with this 
uh, like Caficon syndrome, Sanjat Sakati syndrome. There are many named syndromes regarding this, but one of the most uh, important syndrome to remember is the B. George syndrome regarding the abnormal parathyroid gland development. And there are some causes for the altered PTS secretion also. We, as we discussed earlier times, the CASR gene mutation, that is the gain of function mutation. So this abnormally uh, situated mutation uh, G, uh, sorry, for receptor is going to sense the ambient calcium level as excessive. Even though calcium level is normal in your body, this abnormal gain in function of mutation of this channel is going to sense the calcium as excessive and is going to suppress PTH release or inhibit the PTH release, which leads to hypocalcemia. Again, as we see that this particular receptor is also situated in the uh, kidneys, uh, where the main function is to inhibit the reabsorption of the calcium. Since there is a gain of function mutation, the more inhibition is seen on the reabsorption causing hypercalciuria. So this particular disease is also termed as the autosomal dominant hypocalcemic hypocalciuria or simply autosomal dominant hypocalcemia. There are other disorders associated with the signal peptide changes in the uh, pre-proparathyroid hormone where there is an impairment of normal processing from pre-pro-PTH to the PTH leading to the reduced secretion of the PTH glands. So the uh, uh, ma majority of the disorders are autosomal dominant where two separate syndromes have been described of autosomal recessive type. <coughs> some missense mutation or point mutation where the arginine is being supplied, uh, replaced by the cysteine, which is going to alter uh, the secretion of this or the processing of this pre-pro-PTH to the PTH. So we know this uh, hypocalcemia, the majority of the causes are the hypoparathyroidism and hypoparathyroidism to occur, we know there has to be a destruction of the gland or abnormal gland development or the abnormal processing of the hormone in the uh, parathyroid gland. <coughs> Among this, the surgical parathyroidectomy has been the most common cause of the hypoparathyroidism in day-to-day -day practice. There are other causes of this hypocalcemia as we discussed. Uh, these other causes are associated with the high PTH are also called as secondary hyperparathyroidism. So these main causes are the vitamin D deficiency or the resistance to the reaction. So this uh, can particularly be seen with the nutritional deficiency, reduced sun exposure, uh, the first hydroxylation in the liver has been abnormal or the kidney has been abnormal where the second hydroxylation is not going to take place. Similarly with the chronic kidney disease where the second hydroxylation is not getting them properly. And there is a uh, unique syndrome it's called as PTH resistance syndrome where the PTH secretion is normal but the end organs are resistant to the action of PTH, also called a pseudo hypoparathyroidism, which we are going to discuss later. And some extravascular deposition, where there is a consumption of calcium in the deposition, uh, which can cause sudden hypocalcemia uh, in the acute settings. And sepsis and severe illness due to many causes can cause this. And any major surgeries is going to have the hypocalcemia or can have hypocalcemia. So you need to be very careful of. So to deal with each and this thing, the vitamin D deficiency, as we know, can occur due to pure intake, poor intake or malabsorption, coupled with the reduced exposure to UV rays or the decreased 25 hydroxylation of this vitamin D uh, in the liver, which can occur due to the end stage liver disease. It is not seen in case of a mild liver abnormality. The abnormal 25 hydroxylation to occur in the liver, liver has to be abnormal completely that like a severe, uh, complete cirrhosis of the liver. Even if a mild uh, chronic liver disease patient, you are seeing the vitamin D deficiency, then you are going to suspect either the malabsorption or the poor intake or the reduced enterohepatic circulation for that matter. <clears throat> Otherwise, uh, the lone uh, liver disease to cause vitamin D deficiency, it has to be dysfunctional uh, in a complete way. And we know that there are some drugs which convert this active vitamin D to inactive metabolites, like especially the anticonvulsants, like we know the phenytoin, the phenobarbitol, the carbamazepine, and oxcarbamazepine. These patients, when we give over a period of time uh, for our patients are going to develop the hypocalcemia secondary to vitamin D deficiency. So it is a routine practice to supplement vitamin D for the, all the patients who are having seizure disorder and on these drugs. And uh, we know that in case of chronic kidney disease, the Second hydroxylation step is not being done properly, so which can cause the uh, 
<coughs> calcitriol reduction in the body causing vitamin D deficiency. And there are some disorders like vitamin D resistant rickets where the uh, vitamin D is not acting properly because of abnormal receptors in our body. The chronic kidney disease, uh, here it is the most common cause of an acquired decrease in case of renal production of this 125 dihydroxy vitamin D is chronic kidney disease. And <laughs> hypocalcemia in CKD is also due to the occurrence of hyperphosphatemia. We know hyperphosphatemia is a late feature of the CKD where it is seen in stage 3 or 4 due to reduced phosphate excretion. The hypocalcemia in CKD is mainly due to reduced vitamin D, but in late stages, the hyperphosphatemia is going to join uh, in causing hypocalcemia. The typical severe hypocalcemia is usually seen uh, in the end stage CKD only. In the early stage, stage 1 and 2, <coughs> the hypocalcemia is very rare. Nowadays, the incidence of hypocalcemia in, end, in CKD has increased because the Survival of these CKD patients have increased due to the proper management or some new drugs coming uh, by reducing the disease progression and the, uh, the health education regarding the dialysis has been improved. So a lot of, lot of patients are surviving in the end stage. So that's why hypercalcemia in CKD has become a common entity nowadays. And CKD bone mineral disease is a very big thing now. So any uh, CKD patient, we need to have a separate set of uh, monitoring of this bone mineral disease in these patients. So uh, apart from this, the PTH resistance is a very interesting disease where this is a very rare disorder where the end organs are resistant to the PTH action. So this has been a very common or very <coughs> attractive uh, topic for the entrance exam. A lot of questions are coming based on the pseudo hypoparathyroidism in these patients. In the exams, the entrance exam, especially the AMS related questions, there are a lot of questions are going to come based on the pseudo hypoparathyroidism, uh, where there is a PTH resistance in the end organs. Uh, here, due to the end organ resistance, the calcium is low, the phosphate is high. We know that parathyroid gland acts to increase the calcium and decrease the phosphate. Since the parathyroid gland is not acting properly, the calcium is going to decrease and phosphate is going to increase with the inappropriately high parathyroid levels. So this is what the uh, uh, is called a secondary hyperparathyroidism. Even with the low calcium, the parathyroids are very high. This is inappropriate. <clears throat> so whenever you see any patient with low calcium and high phosphate and with the inappropriately very high PTH levels, you need to suspect the pseudo hyperparathyroidism in the patients. Uh, the pathogenesis here in this particular patient is mainly linked to the dysfunctional the G protein coupled receptors. Uh, you might have learned in physiology regarding the receptors. So this G receptor uh, uh, abnormality is the main pathogenesis in this pseudo hypoparathyroidism. So why it is called pseudo? Because the, there is a feature of hypoparathyroidism that is low calcium and high phosphate as it is a feature of hypoparathyroidism as we discussed earlier. But the PTH levels are very high. <clears throat> That's why it is called a pseudo hypoparathyroidism. So this particular disease is going to manifest with a very typical phenotypic appearance. The, although uh, this disease is also called as Albright's uh, dystrophy. Here there is a typically short fourth and fifth metacarpal. You can see in the X-ray here, the metacarpals are very short and the patient is, uh, height is very short. He has a rounded face, the abnormal face development, etc. And this particular disease is also associated with the TSH resistance. So that's why the uh, height is very short. The cretinism can coexist in these patients. <clears throat> uh, we know that in case of a typical hypoparathyroidism, the PTH levels are low, whereas calcium levels are low and phosphate levels are high. If you see this low calcium and high phosphate with the very high PTH levels, then the diagnosis of pseudo hypoparathyroidism is uh, suspected. In this pseudo hypoparathyroidism, there are types. Uh, it is usually classified into type 1 and type 2. Among type 1, it is type 1A and type 1B and type 2 based on the uh, site of defect. In type 1A is what is typically called as Albright's uh, hereditary osteodystrophy, where there is abnormal uh, phenotypic appearance of uh, the uh, affected person due to uh, the abnormal skeletal defects. Whereas the PTH levels are very high inappropriately with low calcium and high phosphate. If in a patient with pseudo hypoparathyroidism, the skeletal defects are 
not seen like patient does not have any osteodystrophy but the biochemical picture is similar to the pseudo hyperthyroidism that is low calcium high phosphate and high pth then it is called as type 1b so the difference between type 1a and type 1b is both are having pseudo hyperthyroidism whereas the osteodystrophy is seen only in type 1a but type 1b you does not see any uh, kind of the phenotypic appearance in these patients the type 2 is similar to type 1b like type 2 is uh, does not have any phenotypic appearance whereas biochemically it is also similar to type 1 but the uh, site of defect <coughs> is different in case of type 2. The site of de uh, defect is much more lower in the receptor mediated action <coughs> in case of the type 2. Uh, it is below the cyclic AMP production in this type 2 pseudohypoparathyroidism. So there is one particular test you can done to differentiate between type 1b and type 2 that is the urinary cyclic AMP reduction in the patient. So if the urinary cyclic AMP levels are normal on the supplementation of PTH then it is type 2. Whereas in type 1b, even the cyclic AMP is not produced. That's why the cyclic AMP in the urine is not going to increase even after giving PTH hormones in the body. <clears throat> so I think uh, uh, I have made the differences clear here, but this particular chart is very, very important to remember before going to the exams. So there is uh, another entity that is called as pseudo pseudo hyperthyroidism. Even when uh, I was in the, I was going for entrance and you, even during when I was in PG, I had a lot of confusion regarding this pseudo pseudo and pseudo hyperthyroidism. So this pseudo hyperthyroidism we know is going to have some skeletal defects and biochemical abnormality uh, with a low calcium, high phosphate and high PTH. Whereas this pseudo pseudo hyperthyroidism here, the physical or skeletal defects are similar to pseudo hyperthyroidism where the short metacarpals patient is having short stature, patient is having <clears throat> the round faces, etc. But if you see their biochemical pattern, it is completely normal. They does not have any hypocalcemia. They does not have any hyperphosphatemia. Even their PTH is normal. But the skeletal defects uh, makes you to suspect towards pseudo hyperparathyroidism. That is what is called as pseudo pseudo hyperparathyroidism. <clears throat> it is important to remember this thing here. And the next most common causes of this uh, hypocalcemia with high PTH is the extravascular deposition of the calcium. So this can occur in three settings. One is the hyperphosphatemia is the most common cause of this extravascular deposition. So here it is usually seen in patients with impaired renal excretion of this phosphate that is in case of CKD or in case of an acute renal failure where the phosphate intake is very high or the excess tissue breakdown. Like if you see in case of tumor lysis syndrome or the rhabdomyolysis or the status epilepticus, these patients are going to... Uh, release the massive amount of phosphate into the serum is going to combine with the calcium. <clears throat> the calcium and phosphate product is going to deposit in the uh, bone and extraskeletal tissues. So any amount of increase in the calcium and phosphate product is going to increase the extravascular deposition of this calcium phosphate product. The mechanism is similar in case of what you see calciphylaxis in an end stage kidney disease. In osteoblastic metastasis, we know there is uh, due to osteoblastic type of metastasis in some cancers, there is a new bone formation around the tumor. So this uh, new bone formation is going to consume a lot of calcium from the extracellular fluid can cause hypocalcemia in patients. In acute pancreatitis, uh, due to the necrosis of the pancreatic tissue, there is formation of calcium soaps in the abdominal cavity. The exact reason for the formation is not known, whereas the hypocalcemia is invariably seen in case of the severe acute pancreatitis, especially the necrotizing type in the day-to-day -day practice. <clears throat> the sepsis and severe illness. Uh, if you see the ICU patients, the 80 to 90% of these patients, especially in post surgical wards, are going to have hypocalcemia, <clears throat> especially seen in case of sepsis and severe burns type of patients. There are many reasons for these patients to have hypocalcemia. Uh, because of the lot of inflammatory cytokines getting released and the coexistent hypomagnesemia, these patients are going to have reduced PTS secretion, the reduced vitamin D production, and sometimes there is end organ resistance to the action of PTH. And the high calcitonin, we know that calcitonin is a marker of sepsis. So this calcitonin is an antagonist to the PTH action. We know this can cause the hypocalcemia in a patient. And the toxic shock syndrome secondary to the Staphylococcus aureus is also associated with hypocalcemia. <coughs> 
then surgeries like uh, the uh, what do you call the long surgeries like neurosurgeries cardiothoracic surgeries and the complicated anesthetic procedures are usually associated with this uh, hypocalcemia most often you see this post surgical patients are going to receive the large volumes of blood in a very short amount of time where because of very high citrate concentration <coughs> since this citrate is going to uh, bind with the calcium uh, this can reduce the ionized calcium in the body causing hypocalcemia this is usually not seen in case of routine uh, blood transfusion because the amount of transfusion is very less or the any amount of citrate is, is being produced is, will be able to handle by the normal liver if the liver is abnormal if the kidney is abnormal or if the volume of the blood being given is very high so <coughs> these patients can definitely have the hypocalcemia although this is usually transient uh, once the uh, issue has been solved, the ca uh, calcium is going to be normal in your patients. The serum magnesium and the relation of PTH is very important and in fact it is very complicated. <clears throat> this any amount of mild to moderate hypomagnesemia is going to cause the PTH resistance or most commonly the reduced PTH secretion. The low magnesium level is going to hamper the amount of PTH which is being secreted from the stored granules. So the stored granules in the parathyroid gland chief cells to secrete their parathyroid hormone, the magnesium is very, very important. So any amount of hypomagnesemia is going to affect this release, causing the uh, reduced PTH secretion. <clears throat> so uh, the hypomagnesemia you usually suspect because routinely we don't measure magnesium in day-to-day -day practice. Uh, in a patient of the chronic malabsorption or the patient is having chronic alcoholism or the patient is having some cancer and is on cisplatin therapy, which is very notorious in causing hypomagnesemia, you need to suspect the hypocalcemia in this patient. <coughs> Why this particular hypomagnesemia is important in hypocalcemia? Because if your patient is having hypomagnesemia, any amount of calcium you are going to give your patient is not going to correct the hypocalcemia until and unless you submit your patient with the magnesium supplementation. So this is why it has become very, very important. Any patient with unexplained hypocalcemia and any patient who is not responding to the calcium, you need to assess the magnesium level in this patient. Sometimes even with the normal magnesium levels also, if you give magnesium to these patients, the hypocalcemia is going to recover very rapidly. So Whenever you see a hypocalcemia with hypomagnesemia, the patient must be given magnesium replacement before uh, giving the calcium replacement. Then there are some drugs which can cause uh, the hypocalcemia, that is calcium chelators. As we know that EDTA, which is used as an anticoagulant, and the citrate, which is used as an anticoagulant, are the main calcium chelators. And bisphosphonates, denosumab, are the uh, drugs which are used for the osteoporosis where the main effect of action is to inhibit the osteoclastic activity. So since they inhibit the osteoclastic activity, the amount of calcium which is going to come from the bone is reduced, so which can directly cause hypocalcemia. I think this is a paradox. Uh, many of the times you uh, happen to tell your patient that your calcium is very low. That's why we are supp supplementing your patient with the bisphosphonates or denosumab. <clears throat> then you see your patient coming with the tetany after receiving this phosphonate. So you need to remember this particular uh, drugs in causing hypocalcemia notoriously. Uh, then sinacalcet is a calcium mimetic drug where it is a CASR receptor agonist. As we see any amount of increase in the CASR activity is going to cause hypocalcemia. So sinacalcet is no difference in that. So chemotherapy, especially the cisplatin based chemotherapy is uh, a reason for the hypocalcemia. And the phoscarnet is a uh, anti-CMV drug which is being used for the CMV retinitis in the immunodeficient patient or the post-organ transplant patients. This is going to bind the ionized calcium in the body. So this phoscarnet mainly reduces the ionized calcium uh, levels with the normal total calcium being there. So fluoride poisoning is also a common cause of hypocalcemia. Uh, <clears throat> Since many parts of India are endemic to this fluoride, so sometimes fluoride poisoning is also very common, causing severe osteoporosis, the glomerular nephritis or interstitial nephritis with severe hyperfluoremia. So these patients, along with their kidney abnormality, 
can have the hypocalcemia in, the, in them. So if you see the clinical manifestations of this hypocalcemia, majorly there are acute manifestations when there is a sudden decrease in the serum calcium level. Even if there is a margin of decrease is very low, if the uh, time of decrease is very rapid, the patients are going to be symptomatic. Whereas if the drop is major in the chronic uh, hypocalcemia, the symptoms may not be seen or symptoms uh, may be minor in our patients. So the amount of reduction and the time of reduction is also very important in manifesting the hypocalcemia. So if you see the hallmark of this hypocalcemia, that is tetany. So tetany is basically a neuromuscular irritability. So as we discussed in the first slide today, calcium is very, very important for the neuromuscular signal transmission and the action potential, uh, all these uh, physiological action. So <coughs> theoretically, if you see hypocalcemia, these should not take place. That's why theoretically, the hypocalcemia should reduce the neuromuscular transmission, whereas the hypocalcemia is paradox in causing the neuromuscular irritability. <clears throat> the reason for this is not known entirely, although there have been a lot of articles been published regarding the paradox of the calcium in causing neuromuscular irritability. The main uh, uh, pathogenesis is being suspected based on the intermittent change in the extracellular and intracellular change in the calcium level in these patients. So this, what is this tetany? We know that when you, in, during EMG electromyography, when we give a stimulus for the muscle, uh, there is a single discharge from the patient. When you give a single stimulus for this muscle, if the discharges are repetitive and very high frequency, then it is called as tetany. So tetany is a repetitive and high frequency discharges after a single stimulus. And this amount of irritability or hyperexcitability, which we see in case of hypocalcemia, is seen in all levels of nervous system. Not only the peripheral nervous system, it can be seen in the central nervous system, it can be seen in the autonomic nervous system, in the neuromuscular junction, anything. So if this uh, hypocalcemia is mild, then the neuromuscular irritability mainly manifests as a sensory-based symptoms like perioral numbness, which has been also regarded as the first symptom of hypocalcemia, also associated with some paresthesias of hands and feet and some muscle cramps. When this uh, hypocalcemia becomes severe, this can manifest as a spasms. So these spasms can be uh, in the hands and the legs causing carpopedal spasm, or it can be in the larynx causing laryngospasm. And this neuromuscular irritability can uh, herald the onset of the seizures, especially the focal and generalized seizures. Sometimes there are uh, status epilepticus due to hypocalcemia, which we are usually seen in adults, but it is also very common in case of infants and neonates. Whereas the most common uh, reason for, one of the most common reason for neonatal seizure is hypocalcemia. In adults also, the hypocalcemia induced status epilepticus is very common where until and unless you correct the calcium level, your seizures are not going to subside. So this tetany to occur, the calcium has to go below 7 to 7.5. As we see, any amount of uh, drop in the calcium that is less than 8.5 is considered as hypocalcemia. The mild reduction may not have this tetany. <clears throat> uh, the tetany to occur, the calcium has to go um, below 7 to 7.5 or either as calcium below 4.3. <clears throat> as we see, the tetany is manifested in all the levels of nervous system and all the types of the uh, new nerve output that is both sensory and the muscle uh, outputs. And uh, the first symptoms are usually the perioral and acral paresthesias, which have been described in the patients. Sometimes the tetany can be latent, like patient may not have the actual tetany, but there are some inducing uh, stimulus which can induce the tetany, also called as latent tetany. There are two signs which have been described in the literature, that is trogeous sign and chostic sign. Everybody of you must have heard these two famous signs. The trogeo signs is basically the induction of this spasm, uh, the carpal spasm, the carpal meaning the wrist, the induction of the wrist spasm by the inflation of this sphygmomanometer above the systolic blood pressure for three minutes. This is very, very important. So sometimes everybody knows that we need to tie the blood pressure, cough, and we need to inflate. But nobody knows uh, to what range we need to uh, inflate and to what time we should inflate you need to inflate it for three minutes and above the systolic blood pressure. So then we're going to see the carpal spasm. So this carpal spasm has been described in four uh, 
uh, anatomical abnormalities. That is, the first thing to occur is the adduction of the thumb and the flexion of the metacorpophalangeal joints and the flexion of the wrist joints and extension of the interphalangeal joints. Why this occurs when, the, when we uh, inflate the sphygmomanometer cuff? This is because we are inducing the ischemia, where the ischemia increases the irritability or the excitability of the nerves. So since there is hypocalcemia, which is there as a latent thing, when we induce ischemia, this excitability is going to increase, causing the carpopedal spasm. So why three minutes? Because three minutes is must to induce the nerve ischemia. Any amount of increase in the time, like if you don't see any carpal spasm in the three minutes, any further increase in the time is not going to establish the carpal spasm. <clears throat> so the three minutes is a cutoff. If you see, uh, observe for three minutes, if the torsion sign is coming, okay, uh, it's okay. If it is not coming, then leave it. Otherwise, you're going to harm your patients by causing ischemia. The other sign uh, or a less specific sign is a chostic sign where there is a contraction of the ipsilateral facial muscles, which are elicited by the tapping the facial nerve just anterior to the ear. Here, uh, the response you see is a twitching of the lips, or sometimes the, all facial muscles can go into spasm. Here, the chostic sign is depends on the severity, and it uh, can occur in normal subjects, sometimes who are uh, hyper excited, like anxiety or hypothyroidism patients also. Whereas among these two signs of latent tetany, the trogeous sign is considered to be the more specific one, like 90% specificity, whereas chostic sign is having only uh, 10 to 20% of specificity. So uh, we know that this chostic sign to occur, the first sign is the adduction of the thumb and the uh, flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joints and the flexion of the wrist, whereas the extension of the interphalangeal joints. In chostic sign, we know we, need, we, have, we give a sharp tap just anterior to the tragus where the facial nerve exits or enter into the parathyroid, sorry, into the uh, <coughs> parotid gland, which is going to cause the twitching or the spasm of the uh, lips or the entire facial muscles of that particular side. The other symptoms are being the seizures. Whenever the hypocalcemia is very severe, or especially in case of infants or neonates, the seizures can be seen. So these seizures uh, <coughs> can be of focal type, or it can be of the generalized type. It can be sometimes the atonic type <coughs> can be seen in case of seizures. Even the uh, type of seizure, which is called as epilepsy partial is continuum, which has been also termed as metabolic seizure, can also be seen in case of hypocalcemia. And sometimes this seizure can be seen without tetany because the hypocalcemia is being uh, only seen in case of CSF concentration, whereas serum concentration may be pretty uh, normal. So that's why tetany is not seen, whereas the CSF concentration of hypocalcemia is going to cause the seizures alone. The papilledema, the ocular manifestations of hypocalcemia are very, very important. <clears throat> this can also be the entrance question. So any cause of hypocalcemia uh, is able to cause this papilledema. And this is completely reversible with the treatment. And this papilledema is seen only with the severe hypocalcemia when this calcium levels go below 7 or 6.5 milligram. <clears throat> this may not be accompanied by high CSF pressure. Like if you measure the CSF pressure, this may completely be normal. Whereas if you see the fundus, the papilledema is seen. <clears throat> Sometimes the long standing uh, papilledema, sorry, long standing hypocalcemia can also cause the optic neuritis. Uh, where you difference of the optic neuritis and papilledema is from the visual acuity. In papilledema, the visual acuity is usually normal, whereas optical neuritis is going to have a reduced visual acuity. So any patient with a hypocalcemia, long-standing papilledema is complaining of reduced visual acuity, you need to suspect the coexistent optic neuritis in these patients. The psychiatric manifestations we know are very common with hypercalcemia or also common with hypocalcemia, where there is emotional instability, anxiety, depressions, and sometimes schizophrenia are also seen in these kinds of patients. The cardiovascular features are very uh, important in these patients. Uh, sometimes any patient with hypotension <clears throat> are complicated by the coexistent hypocalcemia. Like if you see a patient of hypotension and you're, you're giving him a lot of bloods, uh, the incidence of hypocalcemia is going to increase in these patients. <clears throat> and we know that hypocalcemia is one of the uh, cause of this reversible cardiomyopathy. So we know that there are some causes of reversible cardiomyopathy, like the alcoholic cardiomyopathy in early stages, 
and some selenium induced cardiomyopathy uh, similarly the calcium uh, sorry hypercalcemia induced cardiomyopathy is been reported in the literature and is also very common and it is also reversible with the calcium supplementation whereas the most characteristic cardiovascular effects of the hypercalcemia are seen in the uh, electrical abnormalities that is the prolongation of this QT interval. This is because the phase two of this action potential of the cardiac muscle, which is mainly done by the calcium influx is not going to occur properly. So the hypocalcemia is going to prolong this phase two action potential, making them prone for this early depolarizations and triggered arrhythmias, sometimes going into the torsitus D pointers. So similarly, uh, it can occur in hypokalemia. Although the hypokalemia induced torsitus D pointus is very common, the hypocalcemia induced torsitus D pointus is not that much common. But yes, it can be seen. We need to have a, uh, we need to keep that in mind that hypocalcemia is going to cause the ventricular arrhythmia that is polymorphic in nature. The serious arrhythmias are usually very rare because it is usually by the time serious arrhythmia usually occurs, the patient usually have the tetany and treatment would have been done. So if you see this particular typical ECG, see the QT interval here. I think it is uh, one big box to two and a half. So one big box is 200 millisecond and two that is 400. Here it is plus three small box, 460. And here plus two, that is 500 millisecond is the QT interval in this. So we know that any QT interval of more than 450 millisecond in males and 470 millisecond in females is considered to be <coughs> prolonged QT interval. But the rough thumb of rule here is if the QT interval is more than the half of the RR interval, then the QT is, uh, QT is definitely prolonged. So if you see here, the RR interval is definitely, uh, if you take the 50% of the RR interval here, here the QT should end. But here it is prolonging beyond the uh, half of the RR interval. So that's why this patient can is usually uh, suspected to have a hypercalcemia. So there are some disease specific manifestations of the hypocalcemia apart from the uh, symptoms we saw that is tetany, seizures, papillary edema, cardiovascular manifestations. These are, these are seen in all causes of hypocalcemia. There, is, there are some disease specific manifestations. That is, there are some specific features uh, related to hypoparathyroidism. These are basically because of the chronic hypocalcemia, uh, these symptoms do appear. One of the very common symptoms is the basal ganglia calcification you see. Although this can also be seen in case of hypercalcemia, lead poisoning, in case of chronic acidemia, there are many causes. I think there are 20 to 30 causes of the bilateral symmetrical basal ganglia calcification. The hypoparathyroidism is also the one of the most common cause. And the cataracts, the long-standing hypercalcemia is going to have the posterior subcapsular cataract. So there's a typical uh, central and case of peripheral opacities you see in case of posterior subcapsular area. The dental abnormalities where the spacing has been more, the, the child teeth are not falling. Uh, in spite of that, the permanent tooths are coming and the height of the tooth has been reduced. All these features are seen in case of hypoparathyroidism uh, associated with chronic hypocalcemia. And we see the ectodermal manifestation and skin manifestation, that is the dry skin, the um, skin which is more prone for fungal infection, the candidiasis, that is called moniliasis. A dermal monoliasis is also very common in case of hypoparathyroidism secondary to chronic hypocalcemia. And we see the pseudo hypoparathyroidism typical phenotypic appearance that is the short uh, fourth and fifth metacarpal, which is a very typical of this osteodystrophy. And patients appear very short, obese, and rounded faces, and mental retardation of variable degrees. <clears throat> and absent uh, fourth and fifth knuckles are very common due to absent metacarpal short. Uh, Fourth and fifth metacarpals are also <clears throat> typical feature of this pseudo hyperthyroidism, are also called as Albright's hereditary osteodystrophy. So, to revise here, if these phenotypical appearance are not present uh, with the biochemical abnormality being present, then it is called as pseudo hyperthyroidism type 1b. And uh, only phenotypic appearance is present, whereas there is no hypocalcemia or hyperphoscatemia, then it is called as pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism. Then we see, we know that vitamin D deficiency in children is going to cause rickets and in adults it is going to cause osteomalacia. So I think we have read enough about the vitamin D deficiency in all the uh, years. In children, they're mainly going to present with the typical x-ray changes 
sometimes bony pains, hypotonia, the muscle weakness, mental retardation, the growth stunt, and alopecia, especially the vitamin D uh, resistant rickets is a very typical feature of alopecia here. In adults, the bone pains, the joint pains, muscle weakness, and the bone tenderness, and sometimes waddling gait due to in an increased risk of fractures. So if you sit in a medicine OPD, I think every alternate patient, especially the old age patients in a geriatric OPD is going to come with these complaints that is they're feeling weak, they're not able to wake up from the sitting position, the joint pains and the bone pains, they does not have any uh, arthropathies, etc. But if you see the vitamin D, it is going to be uh, deficient, is a very common entity in case of uh, India. Invariably, uh, more than 50% of patients of India, vitamin D is going to be less than below 20. <coughs> so <coughs> that's why the sub, uh, suspect should be very high. That's why if you see uh, the many of the prescription of the doctors, endocrinologists, physicians, invariably every patient is will be receiving the vitamin D even without any hypocalcemia or vitamin D to prevent them to have the <coughs> hypocalcemia or these symptoms. And we know that this uh, autosomal dominant hypocalcemia, there is uh, <coughs> hypocalcemia is usually seen as a long-standing entity. Majority of them are asymptomatic. But the clues of this particular syndrome is the familial nature. Since this is autosomal dominant and very high uh, penetrance, <coughs> the families are going to have hypocalcemia. And very important entity about this syndrome of autosomal dominant hypocalcemia which is also associated with hypercalciuria, as we see due to increased activity of this calcium sensing receptor in the kidney. So if you give these patients of excess to calcium and vitamin D, the hypercalciuria is going to increase and this hypercalciuria is going to have a renal complications that is nephrolithiasis, nephrocalcinosis and renal deposition of interstitial uh, calcium causing interstitial nephritis and further progressing to chronic kidney disease is very common in these patients. So that's why in these patients, you need to measure the urinary calcium while you submit them with the calcium and vitamin D. <clears throat> then how to diagnose our patients? The first thing to diagnose in hypocalcemia is just confirm the hypocalcemia because it is the major entity and it is the very big entity in our patients. Only after the confirming uh, hypocalcemia, we will going to determine the etiology. Why confirmation of hypocalcemia is very important because a lot of the laboratories due to underestimate the importance of calcium being measured <coughs> just by uh, uh, tourniquet uh, majority of the sampling is being done with a tourniquet this the tourniquet binding is going to increase the calcium in the subsequent sample so <coughs> that's why in the routine laboratory measurement when you see a low calcium level you need to confirm this by the repeat measurements <coughs> and uh, many of the patients are going to have abnormal albumin levels in the body. So we need to have the albumin correction in these patients. But to avoid all these things, the best and the gold standard thing to confirm the hypocalcemia is measuring ionized calcium. As I told you previously, nowadays all the laboratories have been equipped to measure the ionized calcium. <coughs> but uh, some laboratories do measure the total calcium even now. In these patients, in this particular set, it is difficult to measure ionized calcium because it is very costly. And here, whenever you take a sample to measure ionized calcium, the sample has to be pres preserved, particularly in 7.4 pH to <coughs> what you call to uh, reduce the misinterpretation of the result. Because any amount of alkalosis, as I told you, is going to cause reduced ionized calcium concentration. So the sample has to be maintained in the 7.4 range of pH uh, <clears throat> before measuring the ionized calcium in patient. That's why this test is being very costly nowadays. <clears throat> and the repeat measurement of calcium is very, very important. Even uh, while in my MD period, <clears throat> we need to, we, we, we used to measure every cal uh, calcium, phosphate, and the vitamin D levels uh, successively for three days in any patient who is coming with the hypocalcemia. The single reading of hypocalcemia or hypercalcemia for that matter is not going to lead you to anything. Only when you uh, measure this uh, successive readings, it is going to benefit you. And whenever you measure this, all these things, like if you are measuring PTH, if you are measuring calcium, ionized, total albumin, you need to measure all those things in a single sample. We cannot measure calcium one day, phosphate one day, PTH one day, 
then it is going to be uh, abnormal result. A single sample, you need to measure for the calcium, phosphate, vitamin D, PTH, and NH calcium and albumin. Uh, please remember this. If you are measuring from the different samples, then it is definitely wrong. You definitely cannot interfere the results. Then some, there are some clues, like if there is a family history of hypocalcemia, then you need to suspect some abnormal gland developments or the autosomal dominant hypocalcemia. And there are a lot of phenotypic abnormalities as we discussed in the area. If there's a history of surgery in the concerned area, look for associated autoimmunity, like if the patient has the adrenal insufficiency, chronic mucopitinous candidiasis, other autoimmunities, like if the patient is diagnosed with pernicious anemia, type 1 diabetes, if the patient is Addison's, if the patient has chronic autoimmune uh, hepatitis, all these need to be <coughs> suspected in patients uh, of hypocalcemia. Then other pertaining history, like if the patient is having CKD, then yes, hypocalcemia can be easily explainable. Then acute settings like acute pancreatitis, the tumor lysis syndrome, rhabdomyolysis syndrome, where the hypocalcemia can be acute. So in tumor uh, lysis syndrome, the only thing to drop is the calcium. All the other things are going to increase. There is sodium is going to increase, potassium is going to increase, uric acid is going to increase. The only thing which is going to decrease is uh, calcium. <clears throat> so further laboratory evaluation after confirming, yes, we know that this patient has hypercalcemia involves measurement of all these things. That is serum PTH concentration, the phosphate, the magnesium, the vitamin D and others. <clears throat> so this particular uh, slide is very, very important here. So, in any patient who is having the low corrected calcium, if you measure the PTH, if it is low, then the hypoparathyroidism is literally proven. Especially if you see a low calcium and a high phosphate. If you see a low calcium and high phosphate in day-to-day -day practice, and if that patient's creatinine is normal, that patient's kidney function are normal, does not have any chronic kidney disease, then the hypoparathyroidism is the next diagnosis. So please remember, this should be at the tip of your tongue. Any patient with a low calcium, high phosphate with normal creatinine is hypoparathyroidism until and unless proved. Yes, there is a possibility of it having pseudo hypoparathyroidism, but since it is a very rare syndrome, the hypoparathyroidism is the first thing we are going to see in our patients. <clears throat> Uh, the first thing uh, after seeing the uh, PTH is going to be low in case of hypoparathyroidism. Whereas in other causes, like if there is a pseudo hypoparathyroidism, if there is a vitamin D deficiency, whereas in chronic kidney disease, the PTH is going to be elevated in the presence of hypocalcemia. Whereas the uh, uh, autosomal dominant hypocalcemia due to activating mutation of this calcium sensing receptor is going to have a normal uh, PTH levels or sometimes very low PTH levels. Similarly, the uh, hypomagnesemia, if there is a patient of hypocalcemia and your serum uh, PTH is normal or lightly low, then you need to suspect the hypomagnesemia in your patient. <laughs> Next thing you measure is phosphate. As I told you, <clears throat> the, any patient with low calcium and high phosphate is having hypoparathyroidism provided kidney function is normal. The most common cause of this elevated phosphate is the chronic kidney disease. If the chronic kidney disease is not there and phosphate is elevated, then you need to suspect hypoparathyroidism. I think I have told it more than six to seven times in this particular last 10 seconds to make you remember that anything which is low calcium and high phosphate with normal serum creatinine is hypoparathyroidism until and unless proved. If you see the other causes, like if you see vitamin D deficiency, since vitamin D uh, <coughs> Uh, deals the phosphate similarly as it deals with calcium. So the calcium and the phosphate are going to be proportionate in case of vitamin D deficiency. If the calcium is low, sodium is, phosphate is also low. If it is normal, then it is also normal in case of vitamin D deficiency. <coughs> Next thing which is very, very important is the magnesium. <coughs> in case of the uh, hypocalcemia, all the other things are normal. Then you need to measure the serum magnesium. If you see here, all the things are having normal magnesium. The only thing which is having low magnesium with the low calcium is hypomagnesemia. So <clears throat> all the patients in which your hypocalcemia has been persisting and you're not getting any clues to the diagnosis, then you need to directly measure the magnesium, which will be low. Sometimes the magnesium may be normal. <clears throat> that is called as magnesium responsive hypocalcemia, where the hypocalcemia is going to be corrected only after giving magnesium supplementation, even with the normal magnesium concentration. That is also very, very important here. 
Next, you need to know the uh, vitamin D estimation here. Uh, in routine practice, we are measuring the uh, 25 hydroxy uh, vitamin D or 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, that is calcidiol and calcitriol routinely. <coughs> if you see the uh, vitamin D deficiency here, in vitamin D deficiency, yes, calcidiol is definitely going to be low. Whereas calcitriol can be normal or high. So this appears like a paradox. Why this occurs? Because we know that parathyroid hormone has got a stimulating effect on the vitamin D. So this stimulating effect occurs by increasing the second hydroxylation of this vitamin D in the kidney. So parathyroid is going to increase the second or one alpha hydroxylation in the kidneys. So since there is a vitamin D deficiency and hypocalcemia, we know that parathyroid is going to act in a much more aggressive way causing secondary hyperparathyroidism. So this increased parathyroid activity in case of vitamin D deficiency is going to increase the calcitriol production. So that's why in case of vitamin D deficiency, if you measure the calcitriol, it is going to be normal or high, whereas the calcidiol is invariably low. <clears throat> whereas if you see in an isolated hypoparathyroidism case, if you measure the vitamin D that is calcidiol, it is normal. Whereas calcitriol can be low in case of hypoparathyroidism. This is a very important paradox you should remember. So a lot of entrance question uh, takes you to misinterpret the questions which they come in the exams. So the concept behind this is uh, here, the parathyroid is going to increase the vitamin D production by acting via kidney by increasing the second hydroxylation. Whereas first hydroxylation has not been affected. That's why the vitamin D deficiency you need to prove, you need to measure the calcidiol measurements. In case of the chronic kidney disease, the creatinine is going to be elevated invariably as we know. So how your after uh, diagnosing the hypocalcemia and after determining the cause of hypocalcemia, you are going to treat the patient. Uh, you are having two types of approaches here, that is therapeutic approach and disease specific approach. The therapeutic approach is the calcium is low, just give the patient the calcium. Yes, how to give is a discussion. The disease specific approach, you try to treat the basic underlying abnormality. So in case of therapeutic approach, uh, you need to distinguish your patients, whether they are having a severe hypocalcemia or acute hypocalcemia or a symptomatic hypocalcemia. Because any patient who is having severe or asymptomatic or acute, yes, you need to give these patients intravenous calcium in three occasions. One is when the patients are having symptoms of the hypocalcemia, like patients are presenting with the tetany, carpal spasms, even the latent tetany. And if the patients are presenting with the seizures, or if the patient is having a prolonged QT interval, as I told you in the ECG, and any acute decrease in serum calcium, like if, as we see in case of serum uh, tumor lysis, lysis syndrome, hypocalcemia, acute pancreatitis, etc., and amount of degree should be to less than 7.5 or ionized calcium of less than 3. Even if these patients are asymptomatic, even if these patients does not have any QT prolongation, I am giving these patients intravenous calcium because these patients are at very high risk of developing the symptoms in the due course. <clears throat> Whereas if the patient is mildly symptomatic or if the patient is only having mild hypocalcemia or if the patient is having chronic hypocalcemia, then the oral calcium supplementation is the rule. When you decided your patients to give intravenous calcium, that is when the patient is having the symptomatic hypocalcemia or the QT prolongation in the ECG or the acute severe reduction in the calcium, the way of giving calcium initially is you are giving IV calcium as one to two gram of calcium gluconate. <clears throat> you, you will get a, a vials in the market of the one gram two grams, we, we usually in routine practice, we use 1000 mg, that is one gram calcium gluconate, which is equivalent to the 90 to 180 mg of elemental calcium. This is also very, very important number here. Many of the examiners do ask in the YOOC, the amount of elemental calcium in the calcium gluconate. You need to remember that one vial of calcium gluconate have 90 to 180 mg of elemental calcium. So this, amount of calcium gluconate you are going to give in 50 ml of the solution that is either 5% dextrose or the normal saline because you cannot directly inject inject the calcium gluconate as it is <coughs> highly irritant to the uh, veins which can cause sudden severe thrombophlebitis. 
so this has been diluted in the 5% dextrose or the normal saline so which is to be infused very slowly over 10 to 20 minutes here i am discussing about the adult treatment only for the neonates it is different the pediatrician will be dealing with that <clears throat> the very rapid reduction very, sorry very rapid injection of this calcium gluconate can cause sudden cardiac asystole or severe bradycardia where the patients can die due to sudden infusion <clears throat> So when you when we give this amount of calcium, that is one to two gram of calcium gluconate over ten to twenty minutes, this is going to uh, make your calcium happy for next two to three hours. Whereas if the patient is uh, having persistent hypocalcemia or any evidence of chronic hypocalcemia, this uh, loading dose should be followed by a maintenance dose. <coughs> uh, Maintenance dose which we usually use is the 0.5 to 1.5 mg per kg. To better remember, make take it average that is 1 mg per kg of elemental calcium. So make a solution of the uh, 1 mg per ml, like put the uh, 10 gram of calcium gluconate in 1 liter of saline, which makes it 1 mg of elemental calcium approximately uh, <clears throat> to the 1 ml. So you can give the uh, recommended 1 mg per kg of elemental calcium. For example, if the patient is having 60 kg, you can give directly 60 mg per hour infusion, 60 ml per hour infusion if the solution is uh, 1 mg per ml solution. <clears throat> so this is the uh, very common popular uh, uh, practical brand which we use that is glue C of calcium gluconate, where if you see here, the amount of elemental calcium in each ml is 9 mg, that is the 10 ml contains 90 mg or sometimes 93 mg. <clears throat> 90 mg is better to remember. And always remember the possibility of concurrent hypomagnesemia in your patient of hypocalcemia because as I told you earlier, if the patient has hypomagnesemia, he is not going to recover just by giving calcium supplementation. You need to correct this patient with a hypomagnesemia, maybe 2 gram of magnesium is been advised in the 10% uh, dilution given over a period of 10 to 20 minutes. And sometimes patient need to be supplemented, the prolonged magnesium supplementation, especially if he's chronic alcoholic or malabsorption or the malignancy patients. <clears throat> and the IV calcium maintenance dose is continued till the patient is receiving an effective regimen of oral calcium and vitamin D. This is particularly important in case of post-operative setting. Till how much time you need to give your patient IV calcium is Till the patient is able to take orally the effective amount of the oral calcium and vitamin D. <clears throat> and the, for the mildly symptomatic patients, you are going to give the oral calcium supplementation. Well, please remember the dose, the elemental calcium of 1500 to 2000 milligram, which is given as either calcium carbonate or calcium chloride in the daily divided doses. The elemental calcium dose is 1500 to 2000. So this is a very famous brand of the calcium that is Shalcal. Here, the elemental calcium is 500 mg. So I have seen many of the patients of hypercalcemia being treated with the OD dose of Shalcal or BD dose of Shalcal. This is very wrong. The minimal adult recommended dose of elemental calcium is 1500 to 2000 for treatment purpose. I'm not speaking about the prophylactic purpose here. For the treatment purpose, Every 1,250 milligram of this calcium carbonate tablet contains the elemental calcium of 500 milligram. So this minimum dose which is to be given is the TID dosage if you are using 500 mg elemental calcium. But nowadays in markets, you have got direct 1,500, 1500 mg milligram and 2,000 milligram calcium tablets. You can definitely use them if it is available. But please do uh, keep an eye on the dose which you are using for your patient. <coughs> in day-to-day -day practice. So if you see the disease-specific management here, in case of hypoparathyroidism, the administration of calcium is alone, which is not going to be permanently effective. You need to give your patient along with the calcium, the vitamin D. And sometimes uh, the patients may require lifelong supplementations of calcium and vitamin D. And here the main goal is to relieve, relieve the symptoms and maintain the serum calcium in a no, low normal range. You need not get the... Uh, calcium range above 8.5 because if you increase the calcium dosage in this patient as i told you since the parathyroid gland is not active since the kidneys will not be able to reabsorb the calcium enough amount in the absence of ith 
so if you give the more calcium the more calcium is going to appear in the urine which is going to increase the complications by causing nephrocalcinosis so if your calcium supplementation and vitamin d supplementations are not enough or they cannot maintain the uh, normal calcium level then the recombinant human parathyroid hormone is been advised <clears throat> although it is fda recommended in the treatment of the uh, hypoparathyroidism uh, if you have seen uh, the recombinant parathyroid hormone or if you happen to see this particular injection in your life just open the a uh, box of warning in the uh, paper which has been provided along with the injection the first thing which they mention here in this with this injection is the risk of osteosarcoma associated with the injection so the risk is very high especially in case of old people who who they have osteo uh, what you call malaria or paget's disease the risk of osteosarcoma is going to increase so that's why the long term safety was not been established and definitely it is much more expensive uh, the famous uh, brand which you call gemtide that is steri paratide that is recombinant parathyroid hormone is called as steri paratide the gemtide the naptide all these products which are available in india but nowadays the uh, osteoporosis uh, is also been treated with the steri paratide uh, nasal sprays i still remember one of my uh, nursing ward in charge used to receive the uh, <coughs> daily nasal sprays in her uh, ward i still remember the way she used to take uh, uh, teriparatide nasal sprays although this is not been the uh, recommended uh, type of practice some of the endocrinologists do uh, like to include the teriparatide nasal sprays in the osteoporosis treatment whereas the uh, risk of osteosarcoma is very very high the long term safety is not been established yes definitely they are costly they are definitely not uh, affordable by the majority of the indian patients and as far as vitamin d deficiency is concerned we need to treat our patient with either vitamin d2 or d3 <clears throat> so in the setting of uncomplicated vitamin d deficiency like a pure nutritional deficiency reduced sun exposure all these going to be corrected by just supplementation because physiology is going to come back to normal so usual way to give nutritional deficiency calcium uh, vitamin d is give 50000 international units of vitamin d2 or d3 uh, once weekly for 6 to 8 weeks then giving the maintenance dose sometimes parenteral vitamin d can also be used as it is available in india whereas in us the parenteral vitamin d is not available in day to day uh, practice we do use 3 lakh or 6 lakh international unit injection every 3 to 6 monthly in vitamin d deficiency patients <clears throat> nowadays the vitamin d metabolites are also used that is calcitriol dihydrotachysterol calcidiol especially especially uh, these drugs are basically used for the patients with kidney or liver disease where the hydroxylation process is not being performed <clears throat> so the dose which has been recommended in case of the vitamin d deficiency so for prevention it is 600 to 1000 uh, international units that is 15 to 25 microgram so remember there is a relation between the microgram and international unit is 1 microgram is equivalent to 40 international unit of the uh, in vitamin d uh, whereas treatment is been regarded uh, considered as a high dose therapy or a low dose therapy it is based on the definite individual preferences there is no strict guidelines to use a high dose therapy or a low dose therapy but i personally prefer this high dose therapy Uh, this is also preferred when the vitamin d levels are very deficient like if it is less than 12 whereas if it is less than 20 <clears throat> there is mildly deficient you can use the daily dosing that is 800 to 1000 international units once daily for 3 to 4 months which are giving whereas if the level is very low then we are giving intermittent supplementation of very high dose that is 50000 international units we are giving once weekly for 6 to 12 weeks which is been available as a form of tablet as a form of powder as a form of syrup all these things are available nowadays <laughs> so this is basically very practical and patients compliance is also very good when we give the weekly regimens compared to the daily regimens and always uh, try to recheck and repeat the dose if necessary for example if you are given the 3 to 4 week course of this high dose vitamin d and you measure the vitamin d still it is very low then you can repeat the dose if it is necessary then you need to give the maintenance dose of this patient that is 600 to 2000 international units uh, od dosage is been given for the maintenance of vitamin d deficiency <clears throat> next to the autosomal dominant hypercalcemia uh, we know uh, enough about this this is by now that is increased or gain in mutation of this casr 
channels in the renal tubules causing high urinary calcium excretion despite the presence of serum hypocalcemia and this serum hypocalcemia is not being sensed by the pth due to abnormality in the same receptor in the pth glands so what happens if you give this patient the calcium and vitamin d if you give the calcium and vitamin d already the urinary calcium excretion is very high the extra supplementation whatever you are giving is going to increase the urinary calcium excretion where it is going to deposit and cause hypercalci urea and nephrocalcinosis and renal insufficiency so one of the way these patients are been treated is the recombinant pth in day to day practice as i told you this can be done with because pth is going to reduce the urinary calcium excretion <clears throat> along with the calcium and vitamin d supplementation these patients can also be uh, supplemented with the recombinant parathyroid hormone but nowadays uh, uh, not now i think in future 10 to 12 years the calcilytics may come into action that they are called as casr antagonist we know that casr agonists are in the market already that is the sinacalcet the calcium mimetic but the casr antagonist since the basic pathogenesis of this is the casr increased activity just by antagonizing casr it is going to uh, what you call uh, inhibit the extra activity of the casr <clears throat> so they can uh, reset the abnormally low set point of parathyroid and kidney but it is not yet available for the human use in the uh, last i think 5 to 6 years the casr antagonist may appeared in the market in the treatment of osteoporosis but they suddenly withdrawn due to the uh, cost and the side effect issue but the uh, casr antagonist as a treatment of autosomal dominant hypercalcemia are in the picture may come available in the future years so if you uh, want to see the few questions here so this particular question uh, i think it is up, appeared in the aims uh, here it is a 26 year old care home worker was referred to the combined endocrinology and obstetric antenatal clinic by her general practitioner due to the incidental finding of low calcium in her routine blood while she was 32 weeks pregnant there was no significant past medical history and not on any drugs but the calcium is 2.1 millimoles that is uh, definitely less than the normal the phosphate is pretty normal the pth is also normal the total protein is also normal and albumin is little bit low so here which one of the following statements regarding the calcium homeostasis during pregnancy is incorrect so as i told you whenever you see the uh, long questions like this make a habit of reading the last line first so if you read the last line which one of the following statements regarding calcium homeostasis during pregnancy is incorrect all this information becomes negligent because we are not going to uh, <clears throat> get anything by reading extra question they are just asking the fact based question here if we know if you are read what is the calcium abnormality during pregnancy <clears throat> you can able to directly answer this question for example even if you don't know what happens to calcium during your uh, uh, routine pregnancy or the pregnancy change uh, you know you are not read any abnormalities of calcium in the pregnancy just by applying your mind you can able to solve the question that's why i have taken this particular question so here the basic thing what they are asking is what is the incorrect statement about the calcium homeostasis during the pregnancy that means one of the statement among the five is the incorrect and one of uh, four are correct so let me read the options the first option is about 25 to 30 g of calcium provided by the mother to support fetal skeletal development <clears throat> we don't know we have not read this appears to be true for some common sense then calcium is actively transported across the placenta which is facilitated by pth related receptor the next option is the free ionized calcium levels increase in pregnancy the next option is the placenta produces 125 hydroxy vitamin d which results in increased intestinal absorption next is total calcium concentration falls in pregnancy due to physiological hypoalbuminemia so if you read these five options the four options are going to speak in one way and one option is going to speak in other way that is free ionized calcium levels increase in pregnancy this is the correct answer here the free ionized calcium and even the total calcium is going to decrease in pregnancy or they may remain same whereas they are not going to increase in the pregnancy so uh, make a habit of solving these long questions in your daily life by reading the last line first and applying the <coughs> uh, 
uh, common sense during the exam. The next question here is the uh, an 18 year old female Iranian migrant who presented to the medical unit with the spasms in the hands and legs, and she was known to have a oral candidiasis for which she was on fluconazole. She had menarche at the age of 16 years and had irregular menses since then. And her adjusted calcium was 1.96, that is pretty low. And her phosphate is 1.69, a little bit high. The parathyroid concentration is 0.2, that is very low. So this patient is having hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia with low PTH concentration. So as I told you, whenever you see uh, hypocalcemia with hyperphosphatemia with creatinine being normal, although which is not given in this particular patient, let's assume that creatinine is normal. The next diagnosis of our patient is hypoparathyroidism. Then they have given other clues also that patient has the oral candidiasis and she was on fluconazole. And if you see her FSH is very high, her LH is very high, whereas her estrogen is very low. <clears throat> so based on her clinical profile, which one of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Albright syndrome, the autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type 1, the D. George syndrome, the Sippel syndrome, and the Wormer syndrome. So as I told you that autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type 1 <laughs> is going to have the oral chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis in our patients. And since this is a polyglandular autoimmunity, the autoimmunity can also manifest as infertility or many other abnormalities in our patient. So <laughs> the correct answer in this patient is the uh, APS type 1. <laughs> so the, uh, in today's class, we have discussed hypocalcemia in enough uh, amount and enough depth. And if you know this amount of hypocalcemia knowledge is more than sufficient to <clears throat> being an endocrinologist also. So <clears throat> even your day-to-day -day practice, the hypocalcemia is very, very common, but just be sure to confirm hypocalcemia before going to be uh, diagno uh, diagnose the cause of the hypocalcemia just by measuring the ionized calcium. <clears throat> Thank you. And next class, we're going to be discuss discussing hypercalcemia. Yes, definitely. There's one question, I think, uh, by somebody he is asking the sir, <clears throat> if surgical patient after thyroid surgery, before surgery, his calcium was 10, and after surgery, his calcium is 8 to 8.5, will it be regarded as a hypocalcemia? Yes. If you are pretty sure that his pre-surgical calcium is 10, that just by a single reading, it is very difficult to... Uh, Assume the 10 calcium as a basic uh, normal in this particular type of patient. If you know, if you are pretty sure that this is a baseline calcium that is 10 milligram per deciliter, if after surgery you are going to see the calcium as 8 to 8.5, yes, definitely this is being regarded as a hypocalcemia. And as I told you in the class, this amount of hypocalcemia is usually expected in any amount of surgery of neck because of the vascular manipulations being done by reducing the blood supply transiently to the parathyroid glands. If it is persisting for some prolonged time, more than 48 hours, and if it is symptomatic enough, then you need to suspect the permanent injury to the vessels or the parathyroid glands being inadvertently removed during the patient. The next question, the first question is, should we consider calcium in nephrotic syndrome? But we generally don't talk about calcium. Uh, I think in nephrotic syndrome, uh, only with the glomerular abnormality without any reduction in the GFR, the calcium is going to be normal. That is, ionized calcium is going to be normal. Whereas just because of the uh, hypoalbuminemia, the total calcium may manifest as hypocalcemia. But if you measure ionized calcium in the case of nephrotic syndrome without any abnormalities in the GFR, yes, calcium, uh, ionized calcium is definitely going to be normal in these patients. Any other questions?
so shall we uh, think conclude the session today okay, thank you uh, hello sir am i audible yeah you are audible now So do we so conclude the session, sir? Yeah, yeah, we can conclude the session. Okay, Thank you. just one second. It was indeed a comprehensive class. The discussion was very useful to us. Thank you so much, Raj Shekhar sir, for taking your time out to teach and teach us and guide us. We're ever grateful to your time. We look forward to all your future sessions with Vitami. And we also would like to thank all the active participants of this session. Thank you, one, and thank you all. I hope you have a great day.